Welcome everyone. We're just going to give about 30 seconds so that our room can fill and everyone's audio can get connected and then we will get started. As you're coming in, if you would like to type into the chat box your name and where you're joining us from, that would be fantastic. You can follow Donna's lead. Thank you, Donna. Oh, and then just make sure you are choosing panelists and attendees on the two line in the chat box. If not, it defaults just to the panelists. All right, we will get started. Well, thank you so much for joining us on day two of the Virtual Training Institute. I am so excited today to be able to present to you creating interactive assignments with Google Slides. We have some of our colleagues joining us from Carroll Community College. And as we're getting started and you're entering your information into the chat box, I'm just gonna launch a quick poll to see what your role is in your local program. All right, well, it looks like we have a heavily, um, heavily sided group to the ESL instructors. 56% of you are joining us as ESL instructors. So welcome everyone. Um, I do also wanna mention if you have any uh, technical issues as we're getting started today, please go ahead and just choose my name, Ellen Beatty in the, um, chat box and I will try to uh, be sure that I get your technical issues all, um, all fixed up for you. All right, so thank you so much again for joining us, creating interactive assignments with Google Slides. We have Shauna and Fatima with us today and I'm going to turn it over to them. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Fatima Taylor and I'm here with my co-presenter, Shauna Egan. Um, as Ellen has already stated, we are from Carroll Community College and we're happy to present some of our uh, suggestions or, or work with you today. So this is my third semester at Carroll Community College. Um, I have not really taught virtually before coming to Carroll. So it was a little bit of a learning curve um, for me, but I think as semesters go on, um, things are obviously getting, getting better. So. I feel really motivated about uh, what we're talking about today and continue to be open to um, other modalities to teach students. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Shauna Egan and I'm the Instructional Coordinator at Carroll Community College. Um, I see a lot of familiar names in the chat box, so thank you all for joining us. Prior to becoming the Instructional Coordinator, I also worked as an ABE instructor at CCC, and before that, as a special educator in grades K through six. So a quick note about today's presentation, we are presenting in edit mode, and it's intentional to allow you to show how to drag and drop items um, and get a better understanding of what we're, we're working on showing you today. So um, please just keep that in mind. It's obviously not the traditional uh, PowerPoint presentation, but we're in edit mode pretty much on purpose. And another point about that is that um, whenever you, if you decide to use this strategy with your students, the students are also going to need to have their presentation in edit mode to be able to move the objects and color code or do any of the tools or features that you want to use. So it's good to model that for them prior to assigning it. 
Um, and also they, they provided us with some really cool tricks to make it so that even though you are in edit mode, you the students can have as full of a view of the screen as possible. So I think some of those tricks were if you go to the view menu, you can get rid of some of the toolbars um, and that kind of helps it create as big of a screen as possible. Our objectives for today's workshop are to explain the benefits of using interactive Google Slides assignments. And while we're more heavily versed in using Google Slides as a medium for um, giving these assignments to students, I think a lot of these could also be used in PowerPoint or, or other slideshow formats that you use. It might just take a little ingenuity and experimentation. Um, also to explore the types of questions that can be used to add variety. Explain the process. If you'd like to implement these types of activities, what you would do before, during, and after using them. And then also discussing some tips to troubleshoot some common issues that we've experienced and kind of worked through in the classroom. So why use Google Slides or interactive slides in another slideshow presentation? Um, first of all, it helps teach students technology proficiency. The process of getting to Google, signing into Google Classroom, pulling up the assignment, um, using their mouse to drag and drop or insert text boxes. There's a, a ton of different ways that you can teach students different technology skills that they're going to be required to use in college and careers. Um, it also makes learning more interactive instead of like a traditional worksheet. We're allowing for more variety because students are able to participate in sorts and, and all sorts of things where they're physically having to manipulate objects on the screen. The good thing about Google Slides, which I'm not sure if other slideshow formats allow for this, is that when you assign a assignment or a Google Slideshow on Google Classroom, you can go in as the instructor and see in real time the student keystrokes. So you can see if students are stuck on problem number two and you can ask if they need help. Um, you can see if a student has, is close to finishing and they might need some sort of an extension activity while the rest of the class kind of works on their portion of the assignment. So it's really helpful to do that. Um, just make sure that you're out of screen share mode when you're checking in on those the student assignments. Um, another reason that it's really helpful is that if students are absent, it's kind of an all-in-one uh, delivery method. Like if, if you create a Google slideshow that has your assignment and your content or links to your content, it can easily be sent to students to help them see what they missed out on. It's also easy to provide differentiation. So we all know that there's so many different levels of students that can be in one class. So there's, there's ways to differentiate and, and meet the needs of your students who come in at different levels. We'll get into that in a little bit later on in the presentation as well. And the other thing we kind of realized as we were completing more of these and making these assignments is that you don't want to have a lot of text or pictures on one slide. So it kind of forces you to pare down your slides to make it simple out of necessity so that the students are, are able to physically manipulate. And that helps with our students because it helps us chunk the information into really manageable um, pieces so that they're able to, to work on a little bit at a time and have success with, with one concept before they're moving on to something else. All right, so let's take a look at some content options. So here we've created a table and you'll notice that in a lot of uh, columns, some of the content options are the same. So that is obviously intentional. Um, you can utilize Google Slides across any of the areas. Um, I wanna bring note to, for the math section, you can do a lot of vocabulary building, sequencing, maybe resizing objects. Uh, for science, you can do things with a science experiment, even virtually, and we'll take a look at how that might uh, pan out. For social studies, you can create timelines, you can also do sequencing or sorting. And then for language arts, you can do anything from reading a link passage to uh, text structure, you can look at grammar, you can even look at aspects of the extended response. 
and also again look at sorting. So let's check out some examples. Fatima, can we pause for just one second? Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. I think um, we also wanted to do a poll really quickly just to kind of see who is currently using Google Slides. Um, so Ellen, if we could. Thank you. Thank you. Fatima, you can go ahead. Oh, awesome. So people are using Google Slides. Very cool. Okay. So let's take a look at some examples. So our first example is a social studies example. And you'll see on the various slides we have in the upper right hand corner, we uh, sort of tie it to the content area that we're demonstrating. So here, this is actually taken from cspan.org. They have an awesome website, um, already created tools that teachers can use. So here, this one demonstrates how a bill becomes a law. So students can move the boxes on the right and drag them into slots on the left. So again, this can be used for an independent assignment for guided practice. Um, even for something that you guys would do together in class, but it's very user friendly. Um, like Shauna stated earlier, each student will have their own um, assignment in Google Classroom. So they're able to maneuver this on their own. They're not waiting to be in a group um, and for a group member to maneuver this. Um, they're actually able to do this on their own in real time. Okay, another social studies example. So this one is an example of a timeline of important events in US history. So here are your text boxes that you can create with filling in different events across, um, across time and students can drag and drop the boxes and place them in order. So you can either have the boxes sort of scattered already um, you'll also see in some of our other slides where maybe the, the boxes or the answers are on the right or left hand side of the slide and then the students will actually have to bring the answers into the main part of the slide to uh, put them in order. So here's a science experiment. So I know we get a little stuck or at least I was a little stuck about um, how to present the scientific method, but still make it interactive. So I searched on YouTube for different science experiments that have already been completed. So this one in particular um, is about inflating a balloon using baking soda and vinegar. So once students get to their independent practice, they can click on the link. I won't click on it because with my luck, we'll end up in YouTube, but they can click on the link and it will actually take them to YouTube in another window and they can watch or do whatever they need to in that window. And then they can come back to their Google Slides assignment and complete um, whatever you're asking them to do related to the scientific method. So for this one in particular, I asked students, you know, we did the inquiry. Um, they made an observation about a different experiment and then I sent them on their own to take a look at this one. So I created questions that they could answer along the way that were relevant to or tied directly to the scientific method. So this is a way to really draw out um, their understanding of what stages uh, they are in the method. And it's something also that students can enjoy and play back the video as many times as they want to it's not something that they only can watch one time. So here's a math um, activity. So sometimes in math, I think we get a little stuck or at least you know, we can get a little stuck on um, how to make sure students understand the vocabulary. So you can actually pop up a few sentences and create a word bank. So if you create a word bank uh, you know, just sort of make sure it's delineated and one part of the slide and you can put your sentences in another slot in another part. 
and then students can again drag and drop their answers. And this also helps with building their literacy skills around math because students, as you guys may already know, often just think about, oh, let me just solve the problem, but they don't think about the concepts or the meanings of the words sort of behind it. So the vocabulary building is really key in math. Here's another example, and I'm gonna take out the view on this one. Okay, so I zoomed out, but this is another math example. So here is a word problem sort. So again, you have four problems, each on the outer sides of the slides and students can read the word problem and then they make a determination on which operation they can use to solve that problem. And then they drag and drop that particular answer onto that little lily pad, so to speak, um, for the word problem sort. So this is a really good activity to do, especially if students need less problems. Um, so this is more differentiated, whereas they can focus on these four, whereas maybe some other students may go through more problems faster, but students are still able to get the uh, technique of the drag and drop and use those interactive skills um, or use the interaction of the, of the assignment. So here's another one. I'm gonna zoom out just so you can get the full effect. So here's a number line. So here you can use, again, text boxes just to fill in certain answers and then students can drag and drop their answer along the number line. So again, another really creative way for students to demonstrate their understanding of the number line and what goes where. And you can change these up obviously with the same denominators, uh, different denominators. You can even do integers, you know, if you had your zero in the middle. Um, so there's, there's lots of options for this. Okay, and here's another slide. So this slide is a little busy, but I'll talk to you about how you can maybe break this down. So this is an opportunity for students to be able to demonstrate their knowledge or understanding of creating a bar graph. So you can go online and get a free template for bar graphs. Um, this particular template, you can fill in a title, you can have your labels. <clears throat> so either you can fill them in ahead of time or you can have students uh, fill them in to create the entire bar graph on their own. And then, and obviously you'll have your numbers, have students fill in numbers as well. And then students can take their graph or take the rectangles and place them on the graph and then they can resize the bars. So that way they can demonstrate their understanding of what piece of information goes with uh, which particular teacher in this example. So again, another way just to use shapes to be able to let students demonstrate uh, their understanding of, of creating uh, graphs. This particular example is another math example. So here they're using the hotspot to place their answer on the coordinate plane. So again, they can use their cursor to drag and drop and place their answer in the graph. And there are free websites that you can use to create the graph. <clears throat> and that way you can just create the hotspot um, or the directions for students to, to follow. Here's another math representation or another representation for a problem in math where students can identify uh, what's on screen and then they can check their work. So here I have an example of a diameter. 
but let's say you want students to do some sort of self-check activity, you can put whatever problem on screen or on the slide, and then you can cover it up with a shape and then they can check on their own just to sort of check their answer. So again, you can do lots of fun things. This is just an image off of Google Images. And then this is just a line out of the shapes um, section where you can insert a shape. And here I just put a, a rectangle. <clears throat> okay, so on to reading language arts. So here's an example of linking a passage or a practice test to another website where students can click and then they'll go to another website in another tab and then they can flip back and forth between this tab and the tab with the practice test or the practice passage and they can complete uh, their work. So this particular one you can also insert, and on any slide you can do this, but here, since we're getting students in the habit of practicing a lot with the test, we can insert a box for their start time and stop time. So that way students can gauge how long it takes them to complete a particular assignment. And here you can put some questions or some information that sort of guides them along the way. So in this particular example, they're being asked to make a prediction before reading. Um, by looking at the title of the story and then they can just type their answer directly into the into the box to go along with that passage or if you're doing some other activity for reading language arts you could have students write down any words or phrases that are new to them or that they don't understand and then they can take a guess for what they think it might mean so again, maybe using context clues or some outside information that they may know, but you can have students type directly into the box. And the good thing about it is while students are completing the assignment, you can look in and see, you know, okay, well, a lot of students are identifying this particular word as an issue. So maybe I should sort of go over this in a bigger, in a larger way with a bigger lesson. Okay, another reading language arts activity. So students are being asked to answer the questions on the GED.com practice assessment. So this links back to uh, this particular slide here. And then they're being asked to drag a question mark next to any questions they aren't sure of. So they can drag their question mark next to their the one they had a question about and then that way oops sorry that way the instructor uh, has the ability to make sure that they can go back in and address that feedback here's another uh, opportunity to practice grammar so students you know the instructor can pop up a few sentences on google slides and then create a comma in a text box and then just ask students to insert the comma where they think it's supposed to go. So another quick way to determine uh, students understanding or if they need more practice. You can also pull different uh, things offline, different images or, or things that you might make up and then ask students to correct whatever they see. Um, I know there's a big thing right now with um, looking at different Twitter posts or different posts where students can go back and correct the grammar because we lose a lot of grammar with a lot of the social media aspects um, that come into play with communicating. So you can definitely pull something online and put on a slide and have students make a determination on what exactly needs to happen to make the, the error um, correct. So here's another activity where if you feel like you're feeling short on time and you can't necessarily create uh, a slide the way you may want to, you can still put up a question and then you can use this little square to just ask students to place their 
answer next to, or place the square next to the answer. So again, another quick way for students to um, identify the correct answer or identify um, some way that they still might need assistance. And here's our last reading language arts activity um, where students will read a short passage and then they're asked uh, what might occur next or they're asked something about the passage and then they can type their answer here right on the slide. And you're able to go in and check uh, in real time and obviously after class um, what their answers are. So we've covered a decent amount of question types. So text boxes are really big um, and very useful. Linking outside material, which is very easy. Google makes it super easy to be able to link outside material on a slide. Um, the drag and drops for any sort of sorting, sequencing, coding. Um, we can do the hotspots as well. And then also the resizing of objects. So students have the opportunity to get the full gamut or demonstrate their understanding of, um, of our work or of the lesson. Okay, um, so Fatima covered a lot of different examples and um, we're seeing lots of questions come up in the chat. Um, neither of us started with all of these different types of questions. We started really small and, and simple and then kind of as we got more comfortable with Google Slides, we worked our way up um, and, and added more variety as we got used to it. Um, but um, let's just go ahead and just thinking about all of the different question types, we have another poll. Out of all of the ones that um, Fatima covered in this presentation, which one of those do you think would be most exciting to use or most applicable to your class? So it looks like a lot of the drag and drop, we, we use those all the time. But yeah, as you kind of get used to it, there you definitely find different types of questions and different ways to use all of the types of questions. Um, another question came up. I'm just gonna try to make sure we don't get, we're keeping up with the uh, questions. Um, someone asked if there were templates for these questions on uh, Google Slides. And I know Karen said that Slides does have many templates and that's awesome. I, I haven't really explored them too much. Um, Fatima, have you seen the pre-made templates? I have, but I haven't used them. So the only thing I do is open up a blank presentation and then um, you, know, you have the title slide and then the next slide after that I use to start constructing the work. So, because I use this a lot, well, I use it for all of the subjects, but let's say for instance, in math, um, I'll just go back really quickly. So in math, if you know that you will be doing, you know, one particular, let's look at the coordinate grid. So let's say I did a lesson on the coordinate grid and I wanted people to practice um, creating their, uh, you know, dragging and dropping for the hotspot for their graphing the point. So I'll create a template slide. So my first slide will be, so I'll have the title slide and my second slide, I'll just create this little point and then I'll copy, make like seven slides like that. And then all I have to do is go back and put the problem in. So that helps on time because I'm formatting them all the same. So same thing with um, it's like the word problem sort. <clears throat> This is a, a great way where if you want students to do like three or four word problem sorts, the slide doesn't change, the problems do. So you just go in and create your various problems. You have those in the text boxes and you can just plug those in on each slide. But this part doesn't change, like the foundation doesn't change. Uh, same thing for 
like the scientific method, I created like three slides for this. And I just made sure I gave enough space for them to be able to insert their answer. And then they had the link. And I'm sure Shauna, when you created this with the practice test, it was sort of the same format. Mm -hmm. You just make sure students have enough room to type their answers. So okay. once you get in the swing of it, there is sort of that like foundational piece of it, especially if you want students to practice different ways, or if you're doing text structure, you can have a paragraph, like this isn't text structure, but if you have various paragraphs, but you're formatting the same, like you're asking the same question, is it, you know, compare and contrast or cause and effect? And those would be your same options for like quite a few slides. You can just copy those the template of those slides and go back and put your passages in. So, sorry, that was sort of a long answer to a short question, but that's pretty much how it would, so it goes faster if you can do it that way. Right, yeah, making the copies, I, I did that all the time, just copying the slides instead right. of starting from scratch. And the right. other thing, um, we, we had a question if we can share this slideshow. So I just said, if any of the attendees would want like the yeah, actual sure. slideshow, just post your, um, email address in the chat. If it's a Gmail address, we can share it with your Gmail address so that you would um, have more access to it and, and be able to make a copy of it easier. Um, but if you have a non Gmail address, that's fine too. You'll just see the examples as opposed to having the ability to make a copy. Um, but, but either one is, is fine. Shauna, this is Ellen. Would this be possible? Yes or more easy for you if we just included this in the resources when we post the recording onto the website? This, the slideshow, yeah, that, that would be helpful um, for if teachers have a Gmail address, um, if we share a certain link with them, they'll be able, it'll like prompt them if they'd like to make a copy and then they would have editing permissions. So this, yeah, this, it, it would definitely be helpful, but there's like another layer to it. I'm seeing almost 60 emails in the chat box. I'm just trying to think of a better way to do that for you. But we can revisit it after the session. Okay, sounds good. And as long as we have this saved, I think I've saved it a few times, we should be good to go. <laughs> the chat. Yeah. Another um, question. Okay, oh, just one more question I think that came up. How will students know if their answers are correct? So Shauna's gonna cover that once we get a little bit towards implementation. Yeah. I don't know a lot if you the, any other. Yeah, I, I have a little note here. Um, a lot okay. of the technical questions, um, like what to do before, during, and after, are gonna we're gonna talk about more towards the end. All right. And we'll we'll try to make sure we get all the questions, but if we forget, just just remind us. Um, okay, so this is something that comes up a lot um, is ways to differentiate. We know that students are coming in to both ESOL classes and ABE classes at all different levels. So it's really helpful to be able to have ways to level it and meet them where they are. One thing that I know is super helpful for us is that we notice a lot of students really have a hard time with the um, timing aspect of the GED test. So teaching them those time management skills is super helpful. Um, we know one teacher at Carroll Community College always asks students to estimate the amount of time a reading assignment will take them prior to starting. Um, so it's easy to kind of build that in on these slides if you add like a time started and time finished box, text box on your slides to kind of get them used to how much time different assignments take. Um, also, um, you could even add an actual link to an online timer so they can kind of see, see that um, timer going as they're working. It also, um, you can do explicit teaching of technology skills. So for example, like if um, there's a technology skill that students are struggling with, like how to get into Google Classroom or how to um, add an attachment to an email, um, you can include resources uh, with embedded into your Google Slides to help them with that. Someone I know asked if you could link a YouTube video, um, and yes, you can. Uh, Fatima has done that a lot. But if you have a specific skill that you think students might benefit from reviewing, whether it's technology skill or content related, you could just add like a little text box that says extra review 
and then include the link to that video. You could also link to a calculator um, if some students use calculators for some problems or a formula sheet, any external resource that you think some students might benefit from accessing. It's helpful to provide it to all students because you don't know which students might benefit from that and that you might not realize. Another way to differentiate is to um, include difference or choice in the number of slides. So this could actually be decided either by the teacher or by the student. You could set it up where you would say, okay, group one, you guys are gonna start on slide three of the assignment, whereas group two, start on slide 10. Um, or you can say, give them a little bit more choice in it. You can say, if you'd like to review this concept, you can start on this slide, but if you feel comfortable with it, start on slide seven. Um, kind of gives them a little bit of more ownership of where they are and, and helps them make those decisions. Um, you can also even say, if, you're, if all of your slides are the same type of question, you could say, assign students to do the even or the odd numbers to kind of reduce it. Um, another thing that you can do is Newzella is offering text at multiple different reading levels. It, ReadWorks also does the same thing. So you could insert links or snip and insert passages at multiple different reading levels on different slides. You could do that as well for language. If you wanted to provide some extra support to your English language learners, you can show them what the text might look like in their native language. And Newzella is offering Spanish text um, as well as the English version. Um, there was another question in the chat about students coming in on different devices. And while Google Classroom and Google Slides definitely works better if students come in on a computer, there have been students that have come in on cell phones. And as long as you are able to kind of walk them through and model how to adapt and, and how they might show their work in different ways, Fatima's had students be successful coming in on all different devices. Um, Fatima, do you want to talk a little bit on what sure. adaptations you did for students who are coming in on a cell phone? Sure. So if students are coming in on a cell phone, you won't be able to see their work in real time. Once they submit their work, then it'll generate a PDF. But in the meantime, you can have students like for instance, if they're doing um, like the word problem sort, they can touch screen it. Like let's say they say, okay, I'm gonna make a system where, um, hold on, let me zoom out really quickly. I'll make a system where I'm gonna touch screen. You'll see where I have like a one, two, three, four, like I'll number my, my um, word problems and then in the box they'll write a one two three or four so when you see it and when you see the pdf you'll see their little swipes of one two three or four you'll see their answers you just can't see it in real time um like for the word bank this one's a little this one's a little long but for the word bank you can always just have them draw lines to their to the slots so that way it doesn't exclude them from participating. Um, same thing for like this one. This one's a pretty simple one. They can just make their own little uh, point. So, and same thing for like the commas, they can insert their own commas. For this, they can just write their answer, like touch screen their answer. So um, it's actually pretty user-friendly, even if a person is on a cell phone. Um, I suspect it works the same way on an iPad as well. If students don't get into the Google Classroom app or they're having trouble, but um, it's actually pretty good to use on a phone too, um, surprisingly. So, so that's really, really helpful because students won't feel like they can't participate. So is it correct that the students don't have the drag and drop feature on a phone, but they right. have the touch screen draw feature? Right. They won't be able to drag and drop, but they can just sort of touch screen their answer or fill it in. So they're still participating and able to hand in their work. And then it'll generate a PDF of their assignment. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. We can talk about like the steps to implement 
Um, now we're, we're going to kind of summarize these because each of these steps um, might take a little bit of practice. But the good news is that there's YouTube videos and, and so many resources to help you with each of these specific steps. So if you're stuck on any of these, I would just suggest Googling and um, you'll find a lot of YouTube videos that have been created for this purpose. But whenever you want to implement something like this in your classroom, your first step would be to set it up a Google account for yourself and your students. And or the students are going to set it up, but you can guide them along the process. So um, someone mentioned earlier, they asked if Google was free. And yes, it is for a personal account. Um, they do have institutional accounts that, that we don't use that I'm sure there, there's a fee for those. But you would set up a Google account for yourself. Um, you couldn't, can't use your uh, college or institution email account. It would have to be Google. And then you would walk your students through setting up one for themselves. Google is pretty user friendly with this. It usually only takes about five to 10 minutes, but it's also helpful with reinforcing concepts of saving your password, um, set, choosing a password that uh, has high security, allows you to kind of review those concepts with your students and walk them through it. After everyone in the class has a Google account, you're going to create your Google, Google Classroom and invite your students to your Google Classroom. Um, you are going to then create your slideshow. Um, while you're creating your slideshow, you can just make it very simple with text boxes or links, um, or you can also use the snipping tool to add images or content from external sources. And then when you're finished, you have your slideshow ready to go, you are going to assign it on Google Classroom, but it's important to select in the class assignment creation tab, it's important to select make a copy for each student. That's going to allow each student to drag and drop their own objects and be able to manipulate everything. Um, if they can just view the file, they won't be able to move anything. And if they, you select students can edit file, that means all students would be working from the same document. So they would all see each other's changes. Um, so there might be times and places for that, but if you want each student to have their own work to check in on, you want to select the third option. Um, someone also asked if you can do this without using Google Classroom. And you could create the um, slideshow on Google Slides and assign it. And the students, if they're able to um, download it to their computer, are going to be they'll be able to drag and drop and, and complete the assignments, but you're not going to be able to see it in real time. And it's probably going to be harder to access for the students. Like there, there'd be a different set of skills you'd have to teach them, like how to access an attachment, how to open it, um, make their edits, and then how to save it and then reattach it. So you, you could do it, but we don't have a lot of experience for that. But I, I know there are some instances that it has been done and you can do the same types of activities. It's just a little different in how you would set it up. Um, during the assignment, you're going to explain the assignment to the students. You want to kind of model any new skills until they get used to it. Um, as we mentioned earlier in the slideshow, as the students are completing their assignment, you can go off screen share or if you have a, a separate device and check in and see if the students are getting stuck anywhere and kind of it'll help give you an idea on timing. Um, so if you're interested in seeing how students work is being done and checking in on that, some good YouTube search terms might be Google Classroom assignments or Google Classroom Gradebook. And there's lots of videos that will show you how to access all of your students' assignments. When the students finish and they're ready to turn it in, they're going to go ahead and they're going to click the, there's a blue submit button in the corner. Um, the good thing about Google is even if your students do not click submit, um, it's still saving their work in real time. So even if they don't finish it and remember to click that little rectangle, then you're, you're still going to be able to see it and grade their work. So it really um, is kind of a minor detail. And that's if they did it all on Google Classroom. If, if they sent it to you, it's going to, the process is going to be a little different. 
after they've completed the assignment, the students can give feedback. So whenever, um, and Fatima inserted a little snip in this picture down here. So that's a, um, a slideshow. So once you went into the gradebook, you could go ahead and you could um, go in and give them a grade in the little grade box. And then there's also room at the bottom where you can add private comments. So once you typed in their comments and you entered in the grade, you would click the blue post rectangle to show them the assignment and then the return rectangle up at the top to return their grade for them. And usually when the students have it set up a certain way, I think automatically it notifies them that they have a private comment or a, a grade in their email. So they can either go in to Google Classroom to respond to any questions or feedback that you have, or they can also do that directly from the email. Um, you want to model how students can check feedback. Um, so just showing them like how they can do that and your view when you're showing Google Slides is going to be different than the students because it's the teacher view. Um, so you want to be kind of careful that you're making sure you're not showing any student grades. But there are a lot of YouTube videos on what a student's view looks like. So again, using YouTube as a resource, um, something like checking my assignments on Google Classroom or checking my assignment grades on Google Classroom. There'll be a lot of videos out there that will walk students through what that looks like from a student perspective. And then um, at the end, just encouraging reflection and goal setting. So um, with, with my students, when I did this, um, a lot of times my, my feedback might be something like, take a look at number two, what would you do differently next time? And just kind of getting them, them in the process of reflection um, not making a huge emphasis on the, the number grade, but just um, what can we improve as, as we move forward. Um, I do see a question in the chat box that says, are you going to demonstrate how to create a Google slide from the beginning? And we weren't going to do that um, specifically, but we, we can kind of do that since uh, Fatima is in, in this. But, um, so we have about 13 minutes left or so. Um, what we can tell you a little bit about it, but I don't know if we're able to demonstrate it in this format. So once you go to sign in to Google and you're signed into your account, there's a little, um, they call it the Google waffle. So next to your initial up in the corner, it's not on in this slide, but where Fatima has a little um, orange F in the corner, there's going to be a, a set of nine dots that they call the Google waffle. You would click on that and then that will show you the option for Google Slides. And once you click on Google Slide, you can just click create new. And um, Fatima, you're in a Google Slide right now. If you go up to the file option, is there an option to create a new? Yep. So there's an option to create a new slideshow even directly from the presentation. Are there any other questions? I, I know there were a lot at the top, so I'm just gonna kind of scroll through and make sure we got everything, but please feel free to type them at the bottom. I do think um, we, Christina asked about reviewing assignments, so how to let students know how they did. Um, and I know we touched upon that in the feedback section, but Fatima, do you wanna, do you have any examples of like how you might review the content in the slideshow? Sure. So in the process of students completing the work in class, I can go in and look to see if students are on the right track. So for instance, if we're doing order of operations or, you know, if they missed uh, a particular comma or a transition word, I can go back and say, hey, can you take a look at slide three? I think you forgot to do multiplication first. So I can give them that feedback at that time and they'll go back. Students get in the habit of using this so much, they might shoot me a message um, in the chat box because we use Microsoft Teams for the main platform uh, for the class. They'll shoot me a, a chat and say, hey, I didn't understand slide nine. Can you walk me through it really quick? So that way I can look at what they did and give them some pointers. 
once the assignment has been submitted, I go back and basically there's the speaker view in, in PowerPoint. You know, there's the main slide and then we're all accustomed to the speaker view, which is across the bottom. I can write a comment for each slide on that. So if I need to give them feedback or give them accolades, I can just write it in that particular area and then that they know to access it there. Um, you can also write the private in the private comment area uh, that Shauna previously spoke about. You can write some comments there too to say, you know, take a look at slide two and seven or um, great job, but still, you know, remember to practice more reducing. It just really depends on how lengthy you want your comment to be, or if you want it to be uh, more specific to a certain slide. Um, I did see a question up above about um, a repository, like if there are pre-created Google Slides that teachers can use. Um, and one thing that I've used in the past is um, the free resources on Teachers Pay Teachers. If you go in and you search specifically for Google Slides, sometimes they have some of those available that you might be able to tweak. Um, you can also Google it, um, Google Slide, and then whatever content you're looking for. Um, most of these that we've done have been teacher created, but kind of once you kind of get the baseline, like a, a template, it's easy to kind of make the changes. Um, is there a voice feature in Google Slides? I'm not aware of any. Fatima, do you know? or even like Khan Academy, you can turn on the closed caption. So if you're looking for something related to that, maybe you could find it somewhere else and then have students go to that link. But, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I don't know in within the Google Slides if there is, but that, that's a great question and definitely worth researching. Um, I know there's probably other external websites where you could, if you're trying to record directions, you could, and then include the link to that on the slide, but that, that's a good thing to research. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, Amy is saying that you can insert audio. Is that oh, right okay. in the insert menu? Then probably. Oh, there it is, audio. <laughs> so I haven't done that part yet, <laughs> but it exists. Exciting to learn something new. Yeah. That is the joy of educational technology, right? Always something new around the corner. Well, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic presentation. I can tell just by the chat box that you've enlightened and in, inspired a lot of people to either continue using um, the Google Slides or maybe to facilitate um, something new for their classroom experience. So I am going to type into the chat box our feedback survey. Um, we love hearing the feedback on the presentations. That's the way that we get better at doing the Virtual Training Institute. I'm also going to include the proof of participation link, but we do ask that you do only one um, after you've listened to all of the surveys or all of the presentations uh, this week. All right, so any final questions for our fantastic presenters today? Go ahead and type those into the chat box quickly. And if not, I wanna say thank you so much. You two are the epitome of peer sharing. Um, I'd love to see the collaboration both within your program and then sharing it out to the rest of the state of Maryland. So thank you so much to both of you for your time and for your expertise. Yeah, no thank problem. You. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank All right, everybody. One more three o'clock session today and then another full day of sessions tomorrow. So we hope to see you again in a future session. Have a fantastic afternoon. All right, have a good day, everybody. Bye everyone, thank you.